this project that I've been working on, um, I've been working on with um, Ursula Oswald Spring, and um, it's we're focused on kind of creating an alternative paradigm through which to to view uh, humanitarian missions and peace building missions as well. And the two are really kind of interrelated. So I figured that uh, we focus specifically on peace building stuff. Peace building also has all kinds of humanitarian issues with it. So um, what we're trying to do is, um, yeah, sort of create a new way to, to look at or to, to view humanitarian and peace building missions, and then hopefully to influence policy eventually Again, that's the long term goal. Okay, so um, yeah, there's all kinds of. Uh, I know, like so, some of the speakers have talked about this already. Uh, G did, although she was looking at uh, sexual violence in Syria. Um, but even looking at, you know, you no, I don't think I've talked about UN peacekeepers or humanitarian missions or any of that stuff yet. Um, but the sexual abuse and exploitation. Uh, that occurs during conflict, although a, a big chunk of it is going to uh, take place, you know, with rebel groups and state militaries, you also now have this really disturbing trend in uh, UN peacekeeping and humanitarian missions, um, AU peacekeepers, uh, the EU, Oxfam, um, a lot of organizations, international, regional, um, they've sort of come under scrutiny lately for their own workers, aid workers or peacekeepers um, getting involved in, uh, being involved in sexual uh, exploitation, uh, sexual abuse, um, and this also um, extends to children. So this is not purely um, adult women we're talking about. We're also talking about children, uh, girls and boys. Um, and with, with this whole, situation you have and i know that g talked about this with respect to um the the victims of uh gender-based violence uh to get accountability from their own state you have issues of accountability here with international organizations and regional as well um, i was looking over uh just sort of flip through uh the procedure for reporting uh, sexual abuse, sexual misconduct from a UN peacekeeper. And these are some of the countries here, by the way, where there have been allegations. So um, the DRC, Congo, Haiti, Central African Republic, and so forth. Um, but there's this incredibly complex process that victims have to go through. Um, and in terms of an investigating and accountability, it's really left up to assuming that they can get through all those the hurdles of filing a claim and getting it investigated, it's left up to the contributing state, uh, let's just say, you know, Central African Republic or whatever, um, to, or, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the, the state that sends the peacekeepers to the Central African Republic who commit the wrongdoing, it's up to that state to really hold um, those peacekeepers accountable. Um, and as a consequence of that and other things, which I'll talk about, um, you have a lack of reporting on the part of victims of abuse. Um, and again, although my, my paper's not dealing specifically with this, this is sort of a good way to highlight the problems, kind of demonstrate um, the issues of gender that take place in both uh, humanitarian and peacekeeping uh, missions. Okay. Um, much of this is going to be, and this is kind of how uh, Ursula and I approached it, um, it's a function of the paradigm that informs the process. The dominant paradigm today for humanitarian missions and for peacekeeping, peace building, what have you, is neoliberalism. Okay, and uh, so it's the idea that we're going to the international community coming together. Um, and again, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, but the international community coming together we solve these problems in a multilateral um, environment through the UN or the EU or whatever, uh, put peacekeepers, aid workers on the ground. Um, and in the process, we're talking about humanitarian or peacekeeping or peace building missions. In the process, it's, a, it's, very top, it's conducted in a very top-down manner. And you have these um, international uh, aid workers or peacekeepers coming in. Um, and oftentimes, 
they've been they've been heavily criticized by a number of scholars for the way they conduct the mission, appearing as though they're saviors, they're coming in to rescue the distressed, uh, you know, underdeveloped, you know, incredibly poor country to help that country modernize. Um, and as this applies to dealing with uh, gender related issues, the idea is uh, humanitarian aid is, or whatever the mission is, it's coming in, it's trying to, you know, make all of these societies, trying to really embed universal human rights norms about uh, what gender is, what gender empowerment is, um, how that country should be treating its population. There's very little in the way of local buy-in, local ownership of the process. It's kind of, it's, it's an outside in sort of, sort of a thing. And it's been heavily criticized by a number of scholars for that. And I think somebody mentioned before um, humanitarian missions and the, the process of um, othering uh, the groups that they're trying to help or uh, cementing these asymmetrical relationships between the developing world or the impoverished world and the UN, the West, the industrialized world, that's that sort of thing. Um, constructivism is a little better. Um, you have the work of, um, you know, Reese Rope and Sicking, Finnamore and Sicking, and a bunch of scholars who suggest that change can occur. A lot of it they associate with norm entrepreneurs. So folks coming in from the outside, we're going to establish these transnational um, uh, advocacy networks, and we're going to sort of get that country to on the road to change, right? Um, but when we're talking about change involving gender, and with change involving gender, we're talking about all sorts of things. We're talking about gender-based violence, which I've already mentioned. You have discrimination, marginalization, economic, political. It, it's, a, it's a big field. A lot of constructivism doesn't necessarily, let's well, push for norms like you know greater equality, greater empowerment, but it's greater equality and empowerment within the existing system. They're not really changing the system per se, they're just saying, let's put more women in there, right? Or let's uh, make sure that women have the equal right to vote and that kind of stuff. Um, although again, I, there's different strands of constructivism I kind of borrow from constructivism, but um, okay, cosmopolitanism, right? So cosmopolitan, and I look to the work of like Richard Falk and some of those other, some of those other folks that they're looking at um, sort of a, there's this growing demand for the countries to come together to, to look outside the like state centric uh, Westphalian perspective where everything is sovereignty and national security and all that sort of thing. And kind of let's get everybody together through global institutions based on international law. That's my I law thing there. Um, and get them, we can all address this together, give more people a voice at the table. Um, Falk is really big on uh, bringing in the voices of uh, vulnerable societies, uh, indigenous people and that sort of thing. Um, Cosmopolitan at the same time kind of rides on this assumption, and this is maybe this is an unfair statement, but I that these rights are universal, I mean, do we all agree on this stuff? You know, where does culture come into it? And yeah, so are we, do these, do these people actually have agency? The, the different groups, the marginalized groups, women and these other people, do they actually have agency? Do they actually agree necessarily with these rights? Or is this just kind of another way of reshaping the top down sort of perspective? Yeah. Um, and then critical theories, feminism is critical theory, a lot of critical theories, and there are some, there's some types of feminism that are sort of getting away from this problem. They highlight discrimination and violence. They highlight the problem, but you don't have much of a, a game plan. How, how does this, how do we move this to change actual policy? Okay, um, so again, a lot of how you see these different types of endeavors is gonna be a function of the, the kind of, ideology paradigm, thought paradigm to which you would hear. Um, and again, a lot of policymakers 
neoliberalism is kind of the way they choose to approach this. Although I would say realism hasn't gone away. I mean, you could sort of consider, I guess, Trump and that there's some realism in there. I'm not totally uh, getting rid of that, but um, okay. The Engendered Sustainable Peace and Security or ESPS for short, um, rooted in the work of Ursula Oswald Spring. And she, um, feminist scholar who's really looking at the interconnectedness of gender with resource scarcity, with conflict, with uh, climate change, pandemics, kind of bringing it all together as they're all interrelated, right? And what she says, and I include uh, sites of her work in my, um, my paper, so if anyone wants to, to, to take a look at her studies, what she's arguing is that this is really a function of the history of patriarchy. So the system that's, I have a quote in here actually, let me just skip ahead of the quote. Yeah, it explains it better. Okay, um, so patriarchy related to organized violence. This is a quote from the paper that we did. Uh, there we go. Uh, emerged simultaneously in different parts of the world at least 5,000 years ago and developed a complex system of power, destruction, exploitation, and control where the economy, policy, wars, culture, religious beliefs, identity, and psychosocial roots had adapted to the history, historical and regional differences. The root elements of this patriarchal dominant system are based on authoritarianism, violence, ideological control, exclusion, discrimination, exploitation, the concentration of wealth, and the dominant male power relations maintained by the system of war. These threats were consolidated over thousands of years by patriarchal institutions through political and religious bodies, self-identified cultural uh, beliefs, social representations, and totalitarian exercises of power. Today, these social representations are so deeply anchored whenever socially constructed that they appear as if normal and as if they always have been. Um, and what she would say, and what we argue in our uh, the chapter that we recently uh, published in this uh, book on peace building, peace building paradigms, is that this informs policy, not, not just policy, but it also informs um, the other paradigms, a lot of the other paradigms that we just talked about. So neoliberalism, realism, definitely, which we didn't really touch on that, but uh, realism, neoliberalism, constructivism to some extent, um, where again, they're not so much challenging the existing institutions is that they're trying to make them better. What we're arguing is that you really need to shift gears and try to um, envision it differently. Yeah. Um, and again, some of this really does touch on cosmopolitanism um, because the, it, the world is seen as having these interlocked problems. Everything is interrelated. Um, from the pandemic to poverty, you know, growing inequality, gender violence, discrimination, and you really can't solve one part of the puzzle without addressing it all. Yeah, so I guess that would be, that's what uh, engendered sustainable peace takes from cosmopolitanism. Um, and of course, cosmopolitan would look at it as an example of, you know, the, the place where we are today as an example of the failure of the state-centric Westphalian system, the failure of all of these other ideologies to really address the root causes, not just the symptoms, but the root causes, if that makes sense. So what this paradigm is talking about is um, changing the status quo. A lot of what Ursula Oswald Spring suggests is do, doing so through education. Um, which is which is fully you know reasonable. In that initial work that we did, I sort of took that idea and moved it one step further. I don't know if practice theory, communities of practice, it's sort of a growing area in international relations theory today, where it's looking at how realities or I guess, you know systems of exploitation, how they are cemented, how they become embedded, why they persist over time. 
and communities of practice. And this is coming from sort of like a mix of cosmopolitanism and communitarianism in IR, but it's saying that reality is an interactive process. So the meaning of reality is constantly being renegotiated between actors, but it's grounded in context. So if we're talking about the system of patriarchy, the way that neoliberalism or the way that constructivism tries to, to take on that stuff, to take on gender inequality and gender-based violence, it's gonna be informed by this long legacy of patriotism, which is embedded in ideology. It's fully embedded in institutions, including political, religious, and so forth. Um, there is, while on its face, communities of practice would seem to suggest that everything is static, that change is not possible. But you do have some scholars now are doing some interesting work in describing how these big sort of, I guess, hegemonic institutional belief systems, how they can change. Um, and what they're looking at is that um, it's not so much, it's sort of, everything is, everything is static. Nothing is necessarily certain. So when you do have change, and the example that it's um, uh, Schlinder, Schindler and Willie, who did the study that I'm talking about, the example they look at is, they try to explain why hasn't policy why didn't everything go the way it was supposed to go after the end of the Cold War, right? We enter this post-Westphalian period where there's gonna be peace and everyone's happy all around. And what they do is they explain, and that's what a lot of studies suggested, right? It's gonna be, things are gonna change, but only in ways informed by the past. And what they suggested is that, no, there's a lot of uncertainty during periods of change or critical junctures, and that it is possible for new voices to come in and to, kind of renegotiate the meaning of things, reality, sort of change our perspective. Um, what I suggest is that now we're at that point, and I guess this again, this is coming from a cosmopolitan sort of perspective, but now we're at the point where things have gotten so bad and with climate change and disease and conflict and, and all of this stuff is not ending, it's now, is, the, is really the chance for, for women in this case that I'm looking at, but other groups as well, right? The disabled, the elderly, indigenous groups, now is the time to kind of push the envelope and sort of get people to, to shift perspective and to see that it's a global perspective. It's not necessarily state to state where every state figures stuff out on their own. Um, I looked at the, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna really gonna go into this, but I can if people ask later. Uh, there's this guy, uh, Gavin Sullivan, who wrote a book um, about the law of the list, the US counterterrorism policy uh, as a response to 9-11. And he looks at assemblages, which are sort of like these groups of communities of practice that are actually influencing policy um, and together, they make this one big policy shift. So it doesn't come down to one person, one guy, uh, one particular group, right? It's sort of a mixture of people coming together, voicing, you know, I don't say voicing their concerns. In his perspective, that's not the case, right? But looking at aspects of the law um, and together they, they change policy. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a big order here, right? Um, so one of the ways is, of course, inclusion of more women in humanitarian peacekeeping operations, leadership roles have gender sensitive policies. Um, and again, you know, you're addressing the symptoms, you're not really addressing the causes of the problem. <clears throat> and this right here, the first one is really in, um, I guess, a neoliberal perspective. Right, so this is kind of the dominant thing. We're just going to make sure we have women. And I've looked at all the different web, the EU's website on this stuff and the UN's website on this stuff. You know, make sure to have more women um, involved in the process. Um, make sure that you have what they call gender mainstreaming, where uh, gender concerns are made. You know, uh, we're, we're stressing that us on the humanitarian mission. We're stressing gender concerns. We're trying to empower local. Um, uh, groups of people, women, uh, the elderly, and so forth. Um, again, 
you have this stuff, but then if you look at the data, if you look at, uh, uh, there's a good, um, I can't think of it right now. Um, I believe it's through the UN. There's a really good data on gender inequality. If you look at, you know, domestic violence or, you know, pay equity or marginalization, women in government, all this sort of stuff, these problems remain. Okay. So it's, I think a lot of, in a lot of these societies and anyone, I mean, people can correct me if I'm wrong, please, but you know, you'll do, you'll make the changes that you have to make, but none of, some of the stuff is not necessarily long lasting. Yeah. Um, which is a big problem. So I look at there's, I mean, there's economic activity at the micro level. You have lots of, of that. I look at the example in Latin American countries and um, I wrote a part of a chapter uh, that, that dealt with this. Um, you have these civil society organizations of women. Um, there's one example in the favelas in uh, the big cities in Brazil where they're going in and they're keeping the peace. You know, it's sort of like they take ownership of it um, they're, uh, you know, accountable to each other, accountable to society. They're changing, I guess, the, the definition of gender empowerment by actually doing it. It's not coming from the outside. They're doing it themselves. That's an example, I would say, of a community of practice, right? Um, we need more of those. Um, and I would also say, uh, fitting a definition of community of practice, um, groups like Gyrus, other uh, advocacy groups that are trying to bring people together. Unfortunately, a lot of times it's scholars that are coming together. And so we're saying it'd be good to do this, that, and the other. Um, we need more boots on the ground. And that's, I could probably think of a better phrase than that. Um, but more local involvement and stuff like that, because I think it is possible. You have like little pockets of stuff going on around the world where you have women doing some some really amazing things, changing the dialogue, and in so doing, we just need more of it. We, we need more of it, yeah. Um, of course, the, the backlash to this, um, this kind of goes in the face of, um, you know, dominant ideology and politics and structures and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's not to say that, like, the legacy of patriarchy is going to go away anytime soon. Um, Hopefully it will, but I think sort of there may be a way to start the ball rolling, I guess is what I'm saying.